and we are live but i'm really really blurry so hopefully this focuses there we go i'm back you can see me in full hd we have upgraded so hello everyone and welcome to the wineless live with our april tasting so i'm isabel i'm head of wine at wineless and tonight we're going to be drinking loads of wine and i'll be talking you through it so the two bottles that we have tonight are we'll start with the white one this one is Peter Marada Chardonnay from the Czech Republic. And the red that we'll chat through is Duzat from Padere Solario in Italy in Lange. I am really, really excited about these wines. So I won't hold you back at all. Open them out, pull them away. I can see Tim's already in the comments saying, so excited he was counting down for the last minute. Um, I can see you in all the comments. So if you want to say hello, you should see a little comment box in the very side and you can say hi, join in with everything, ask questions, which very excitingly, we have both of our winemakers here this evening. So we have Fausto from Paderi Solaria in Italy, and we have Peter from Peter Murad Chardonnay in the Czech Republic. So they will be in comments and you can ask away lots of questions. And everyone's saying hello already. Hi everyone, so lovely to see you all. Hi Emily, hi Tim. Um, God, Sam and Charlotte, I can't even read. The writing's too small. I'm just gonna say hello to everyone. I can see your waving faces, but I am very excited to see you all. Welcome back if you've been here before and welcome if you've not been to a wine list tasting before. Um, we basically just drink lots. So should we get started? Yeah, perfect. So what is very exciting is the Chardonnay we have. Chardonnay is one of my favorite, favorite grape varieties. Um, just before we go into that, Peter said hello in the comments. Can everyone see Peter Murada's name saying hello, Isabel? Hi, Peter. So Peter is there with his wife, Vera, and they will be chatting away through this. So Tim has asked how to open the red wine as there's no seal. Just peel a bit of paper off, Tim. It'll be fine. Go straight in with your bottle opener. You'll be fine. Makes it easier. It's taken the work out of it for us. Nothing worse than when it's difficult to open wine. So, um, ooh, this is exciting. Okay, we'll get into the comments in a second, but I'll introduce this wine to you. So this one I'm really excited about. Chardonnay is one of my favorite grape varieties. And the Czech Republic is really, really going up in the world in terms of wine. There's so many amazing quality wines coming from the Czech Republic these days. If you've been with us for a while, you'll realize that a few months ago, we had a Riesling from the Czech Republic and it was dreamy and wonderful and this one is even better it's amazing so in the czech republic if you have i'll show you a little map but if you have france sort of here and you draw a straight line you'll get to the czech republic so even though when we think about where our wine is coming from in the world we always sort of think france and italy and spain but it's similar, well, the same latitude, so it's gonna have a similar climate. You're going to be making amazing, amazing grapes that are gonna produce amazing, amazing wines. So it's really good to look at other countries, sort of broaden the horizons, look for other places. So what I will do is, um, oh, sorry, is the volume low for everyone? I am a quiet talker. Is this better? There we go. But what I'll do is I'll show you a little map. So this is the Czech Republic, and you can see it's completely surrounded by lots of different countries. So it's completely landlocked, which means it's a continental climate. And when you have a continental climate, it means that it is very, very hot in summer and very, very cold in winter. So it can be good for grapes, it can be a little bit tricky, and it can limit what type of grapes you can grow. But as you can see, you've got Germany, another great wine growing country, Austria, amazing for wine growing, Slovakia, also great for wine growing. Um, but as you can see, there's Prague up at the top left, and on the very bottom right, just near the border with Austria, is Marada. So this is the vineyard where we are at the moment and very, very far south. So it means it's going to be a little bit warmer than in further north in the Czech Republic. But I'll show you a little picture of Peter. <laughs> he sent me some pictures over earlier. So this is him and this is his vineyard. So there's Peter working away in the vineyard. 
Um, there was a really lovely picture of Peter and his wife, Vera, and they were in um, traditional Czech Republic costume. So in Moravia, the region where they are, there's lots of Moravia, there's lots of different villages and each village has a different traditional costume. So Peter and his wife are from different villages, but they both dress in the sort of their village's costume um, for festivals and things. So it's really, really wonderful. Oh, Dave's saying hi from Dave and Hazel. Hi, Dave and Hazel. Hi, George. I love when everyone's saying hello. This is wonderful. And Anne's here as well with Martin, hopefully. Wonderful. So what we're going to be doing this evening is we'll chat more about Peter's wine, but we're also going to be drinking it and tasting through our tasting card. So you should all have one of these. And on this side, you've got loads of information about the wine. I was incredibly limited to only being allowed two different food pairings for this one because it's such a wonderful food wine and we'll see why afterwards. But you have lots of information about that. And what we're going to do is break down our tasting card, see what's going on inside the wine and why it's going on. So we're going to break the wine down but learn about the wine through this. And the first one we'll do is the colour. So when we look at colour on wine, instead of holding it up to your walls, because my wine looks green when I do this, is hold it over your piece of paper at a 45 degree angle and look over the top. And you will absolutely notice with this wine, can you see that colour? How luminescent and orange is that? I don't think I need, even need to ask you what colour this is. This is intense. Can everyone see that? When we talk about intensity of white wine, we often, we often sort of talk about hint of lemon, very light colour, straw, honey, gold, well not honey, straw, hay, golden. Just going way past all of that. This is such a deep, intense colour. How wonderful is that? But why have we got that deep and intense colour? Because it's a 2017 bottle, so this has four years of ageing behind it. And not only has it had four years of ageing, it's been aged inside barriques and barrique you can see on the front of this very bottle so it says chardonnay it says barrique underneath and barrique is basically a french term used for when you have a smaller barrel so you can have big big barrels that you age your wine inside big oak barrels and that means that the ratio of wine you have touching in contact with that wood is quite a high ratio so you've got a lot of wine and not much contact with that wood but when you age it inside barriques barriques are much much smaller so the ratio of how much wine you have in comparison to how much wine is touching and in contact with oak barrels is a much much smaller ratio so you're getting absolutely loads of contact with that oak so it's giving it more intensity in oak aging. So you're getting that color, you're getting more flavors behind it as well. And that can really add to the flavor and to the color of wine. So it's incredibly intense in color. It is golden. It looks like it should be sort of 70 years old, this wine, it's wonderful. So when we look at color of wine, that's exactly, exactly why we want to look at it because we can get so much from it. We know that it's gonna be oak aging inside this wine. We know that it's gonna be big and aged, wonderful. Sorry, I'll stop saying wonderful. I'll let you be the judge of it, sorry. Um, Tim has already had a sip, um, so I feel like we should all catch up. But shall we have a sip, everyone? Cheers, here's to the April tasting. Cling. Wow, I just love a Chardonnay, this is so great. Thank you so much, Peter, I love this. Um, <laughs> Peter said he couldn't explain the colour better. Intense, wonderful, vibrant. I think that's my new favourite colour. You'll see me in many outfits this colour now, and I'm going to call it Marada Chardonnay colour. Um, Tim says cheers. Cheers, Tim. Is anyone in the comments called Simon so I can say cheers, Simon, as well? No, we'll leave that. So we know already that this wine has aging behind it. We knew before we took a sip and we've taken that sip and we can feel that aging now. So let's start breaking it down, go deep inside it a little bit more. Tannin, we can completely cross out tannin because white wine doesn't have any tannin. 
we'll just save that for our red and our orange wine. But we will look at acidity and it's everyone's favourite test acidity because it's all about dribbling on yourself. So our acidity test, if you've not done it before, for those who have done it many times before, please go ahead and start dribbling. But have a sip, swallow it, and then to do the dribble test, you open your mouth straight away and tilt your head forward like this. And you count how many seconds it takes before you have to close your mouth before you're going to dribble really. So the more you want to dribble, the more you're mouth watering, the higher acidity that wine is. If you're not dribbling so much, um, firstly, well done. But secondly, it's because it's low acidity, it's not making your mouth water. It's all about how much acid is inside our grape. So let's all do it, we'll take a sip, cheers. Mouth's watering a lot now. What's everyone else thinking? Hannah's saying three to four seconds before she dribbled everywhere. Um, I was about the same then, I think. It wasn't immediate. When we had, for example, our last wine from the Czech Republic, which was our Riesling Rinsky, our lovely Riesling, super high acidity, very, very young, very fresh, very opposite to this. And that was immediate. It was one second and then you were everywhere, a mess, a state really. This one has a little bit of a delay behind it. So why is this happening? I'm, yeah, everyone's saying three to four seconds. Barbara's saying it. Lily is saying it. Sam and Charlotte, yeah, absolutely. Medium acidity, this wine. Medium, maybe going slightly one millimeter higher, but I've probably put it on the Y of acidity. This wine, has acidity, it feels fresh, it's making your mouth water, but it's not crazy acidity. What's really interesting about this vineyard is, oh, Peter's saying it's better to breathe, yeah. So what's interesting about this vineyard, which Peter told me about, so we had a lovely sort of Zoom call, we only managed to meet over Zoom, but um, Peter's two daughters were sort of running around everywhere. And at one point Peter had his a little, I think she's two years old, and you could sort of hear her <laughs> and then she suddenly jumped up and sat on Peter's knee and joined us for the rest of the whole sort of chat about our wines and she's very very cute she's not that interested in wines but we'll give her another sort of 16 years and then she'll be definitely into it but what's really interesting about this vineyard is Moravia has perfect perfect soil Peter thinks it's the best soil in everywhere really but all of Europe to grow really great wine it's especially good for sparkling and white wine because it's full of calcium. So it adds, when you have calcium inside your soil, it's giving your grapes extra nutrients and it's giving your grapes more acidity. So Peter thinks that the key for this wine to make it have a really good amount of acidity is that calcium in the soil. And deep down where the roots go right down underneath the ground, there's actually a pool of spa water running underneath the vineyard. So it's absolutely perfect. It's giving this wonderful freshness to the wine. It's really great nutrients looking after it. On top of that, we also have incredible concentration for these grapes. So these grapes, the vineyard is really old. It was planted in 1983, just around the same time that Peter was born, nearly the same age. And it means that they're really concentrated grapes. This vineyard has been incredibly well looked after. When your grapes are sort of reaching, when your vines are reaching sort of 40 years of age, they're really coming into their own. They're concentrating in flavour and they're producing fewer grapes. So when you have one set of roots sucking up all the nutrients and water and calcium from the soil, it's spreading all those nutrients out between its bunches of grapes. So if you have 10 bunches, it's sharing it between those 10 bunches. But when your vine starts to get older, when it starts to hit the sort of 40 year age mark, it starts to produce fewer bunches of grapes. So if now it only produces say five bunches of grapes, it means that all those nutrients from the roots are only sharing those nutrients between those five bunches. So they're all getting much better concentration of absolutely everything. So they're getting really, really good. Tim said it almost feels like a dessert wine. It's the concentration of fruits here. So 
even more interesting. I love this story, but Peter told me this wonderful story and he said it sounds just like a fairy tale because it's almost too good to be true. But about 14 years ago when Peter was just starting out his vineyard, he, um, he didn't really have many, he didn't have much land back then and he didn't have much money either. He was only just starting out. But one of his friends said, I have this really great vineyard. Do you want to buy some of my land? So he knew he couldn't afford it. So he took his grandfather with him and his grandfather to maybe see if he could borrow some money off his grandfather. And his grandfather wanted to visit the vineyard. He wanted to see the land for himself because his background was in farming. The whole family's background was in farming. So when Peter took his grandfather to this vineyard, he, his grandfather sort of left him in the middle of the vineyard, marched up to the top of the hill, to the forest, and then started counting paces down from the forest, down to the vineyard. And sort of after a while, Peter was looking at him thinking, what's going on here? And his grandfather said, my father had a vineyard on this exact plot of land 60 years before this. So that's now 74 years ago. And it's com come round in a complete circle back to the same Marada family. So Peter's great grandfather had this piece of land. He was from the next village. And then over the years, they lost the land. There was... Um, lots of sort of upheaval in the area because of communism and then it's sort of come back round again and it's now back with Peter and it's his favourite plot of land. It's a really, really aged vineyard. It's been really well looked after this whole time and it's producing some amazing grapes. So Peter's really, really proud of this. I'm so happy that it's back in the family. It's such a wonderful, wonderful story. It's so lovely, but we're producing great wine. So the whole point of that was the acidity coming from the calcium under the soil. Um, Louise, oh, Louise completely agrees, completely different to the Riesling, but delicious and less acidity, yeah. So we can all agree, medium acidity. We have that acidity coming from the soil because we need it to balance out the wine. But as you age your wine, it does lose some of the acidity. So we started, the Chardonnay when it was younger had lots of acidity and because it's had that four years of aging, it's just edged down a little bit. So now it's at the exact perfect level. It's just been perfectly tweaked so that we can balance all of our characteristics, which we'll talk about at the end. Sweetness. What does everyone think about sweetness with this wine? I know that Tim said it almost feels like a dessert wine, but I think that's not about the sweetness, that's about the intensity and concentration and sort of the colour of the wine. So I think this is a dry wine, beautiful, elegant, dry. When we talk about sweetness and wine, it's all about, it's actually really scientific, it's about how much sugar is present inside your bottle of wine. So when you make wine, you take grape juice, which is sugar and water, you take yeast, which is a living sort of bacteria, but a good bacteria, and yeast eats sugar and creates alcohol and CO2. So all of that sugar has been converted into alcohol. So that's when you know how much sugar is inside your wine. Has it all been converted to alcohol? And in this case, yes, luckily for us. Um, even though I do love a sweet wine, but I love alcohol. So what does everyone think about the body with this wine? We've discussed this before, but if you're brand new to wineless tastings, I'll tell you what, how we do this with our body. Because when you sort of, when you drink a red wine, you can just tell by the color usually. But with other wines, how do you think about what that body's like with a wine? You can't always rely on the color. We almost can here. But what you can think about is in terms of glasses of milk. So if one of your glasses of milk is skinned milk and the other is full fat, imagine how different they will feel. It's all about mouthfeel when we talk about body. It's all about, is it light? Does it cut through like skinned milk, like water, like bodied wine? Or is it sitting round and heavy and full, like a full fat milk, full fat Cravendale, Jersey Royal cow milk? Where do you think this one sits on the scale? Do you think it's light or do you think it's full and round and heavy? Um, I'm just going to say, you can usually tell on the colour with red. You usually can't tell on the colour with white, but 
here, you definitely can. It's definitely edging upwards. Yeah, Hannah's saying pretty full bodied. Emily's saying medium plus. I'm saying, yeah, I agree with you both. I'm putting about 75% of the way up there. I don't know why I'm being so mathematical. Three quarters of the way up. You can go way fuller. You can go like a creme brulee in a glass. This one is a little bit less and that acidity is making it feel really refreshing. So interestingly, our acidity was sort of medium. Sorry, I'm in a mirror image. Our me me acidity was medium plus a tiny little bit and our body is medium plus a tiny bit as well. And these are really nicely balanced up. If you had a white wine with lots of body but not that much acidity, it'll feel really sort of flabby, really overpowering, not very well balanced. But if you have acidity here and body here, it's a really sort of easy drinking lunchtime wine. But we're perfectly balanced between the two. Peter's done an amazing job of just tweaking it so it's perfectly lined up. You're getting the best of both worlds but without feeling anywhere out of balance. Um, Peter's just made a lovely comment, so he's put about an hour ago, he just came back from that exact vineyard, the vineyard where this wine is, and he's working this afternoon then, he's thinking about his grandfather, who died a week ago, wow, at 91 years of age, wow, that is, should we all do a little toast to Peter's grandfather, we're really sorry to hear about his passing, that's, um, that's really, really sad, but it's so wonderful that he got to see you sort of take over his vineyard again so that's amazing i hope you drank a lot of your wine and decided that it was amazing here's to peter's grandfather everyone chin chin cheers what a great man so the next part we'll talk about our finish with wine and finish is one of the most important things to talk about because it shows the quality of a wine. It's the one that I go to straight away to sort of decide how great a wine is. The longer your finish is, the better quality your wine is. So if you take a sip now, we'll all take a sip, and if you can still taste it and it disappears after about two seconds, it means that it's not a very well-made wine, but if you go to five seconds, you can still really taste it it's getting much better, really good quality. Seven seconds is amazing, and 10 seconds is incredible and out of this world amazing. So there's some lovely comments, all cheers into Peter's grandfather. Oh, that is really, really lovely. So what does everyone think about the finish of this wine? I will say that I can still taste now, probably from the very first sip I had this afternoon almost, but we said that 10 seconds, if you get to 10 seconds, you can still taste that wine after you've swallowed it. It means it's an exceptional wine. And I got to, should I show you on my card? I got to 11 seconds, which is exceptional. It's even better than that. It's an incredibly long, long finish. It means that it's a really well-made wine and it's going back to that exact vineyard because it's been so well looked after, because it's nearly the same age as Peter. Sorry, Peter, I won't mention your age. And it's, it means that all those grapes are really well concentrated, so it's giving it a long finish. It also means that Peter's looked after it really well at harvest time and in the winery itself. So it's having a really, really long finish to this wine, just staying with you for a very long time. Oh, a few people are saying sort of six, seven seconds. Oh. I put 11 seconds on this one. I went for a really, really long one on this one. I could taste it for a very long time. Such a long time that I actually put on the verdict up there, I don't know if you can see it, but I put love heart eyes because it was that good. Um, yeah, so we've got a few six or seven seconds. Tim's saying six, Anne's saying eight or nine. Um, Peter's saying it's better when you have a bigger glass. Peter, we know it's better when you have a bigger glass because you can drink more of it. But what he's saying is when you have a wine like this, when it has, when you have quite a full bodied white wine that has quite a lot of aging behind it, you want a big red wine glass. And it means that your wine can sort of open up. When we talk about decanting wine, people usually only talk about decanting red wine, 
But Josh introduced me to a decanting white wine and it's wines like this that can decant and that can do really well from decanting. I have had my glass out for quite a long time, so mine's decanted very nicely. So maybe that's why I'm getting sort of that full complexity, amazing quality to it. But sometimes you can have a white wine like this and it can benefit from opening up, especially when it's been closed inside the bottle for such a long time. So Tim said my love heart eyes look like sunglass eyes. Well, it is an HD camera, Tim, but maybe it just didn't focus. It's a very good drawing of love heart. Um, Emily says just opened hers, so she'll wait until it opens up a bit more. What you can do is you can speed that up a bit. So if you have it in your glass, as we all know, we pour it to the widest point so you have the biggest surface area of wine in contact with the air already, so it's already opening up and helping you. But then you can start to swill it around inside your glass, and by doing that, you're just mixing it up with more oxygen. And that's doing the work of sort of decanting something. It's mixing it with the air, opening up, breathing. So do this for a little while. It's doing the same as decanting and then have a little taste. Try it, see if you're getting new flavors, new textures possibly. And um, what I really recommend with this wine as well is having it quite warm. Um, when we have, for instance, I'll go back to our Riesling from the Czech Republic, but when we had that, we wanted it really cold. We wanted it at the bottom end of the scale of where you have wine temperature, white wine temperature at seven degrees, because it was very light bodied, very high acidity, very young and fresh. That's a great example of a wine that you want at seven degrees. White wine can be anywhere between seven and 12 degrees though. So which wines do you have at 12 degrees? This one it'll be really really good the warmer it is the more you can get the texture from the wine the more you can get the flavors the different levels of complexity behind it and the more you can get that sort of real sense of what the wine is about as well so yeah warm wine not quite too warm 12 degrees and you can do that by spilling it in your glass and then holding it in your hand a little bit just to bring it up in temperature so when you are, oh, I think we've, um, I think we've planned a holiday in the comments. Are we all going on a holiday to South Moravia? Because I'll be there. That's perfect. I can't wait. It's a very, very sunny place. Um, and that's why they're so good at winemaking. If you're picking a holiday, go to places where they grow Chardonnay and Riesling. Always going to be sunny. So what are the aromas that you can taste inside this wine? We have our first circle on the left hand side and this is all sort of the fruit flavours that you get inside wine. Every bottle of wine that you will ever open will have fruit flavours inside it and if it doesn't it means it's off where you can bin it. So we've got <laughs> Emily and Anna always talking about our wineless holidays. Yeah okay I'm just gonna go for it. I think we should plan a wineless holiday. I was gonna say we'll do Portugal first but now I'm thinking we should do the Czech Republic first because I really want to go. But I feel like um, we'll have to wait and see when we can go abroad. Maybe just a sort of English one for now would be very nice. But yeah, Peter, watch out. We're all coming. <laughs> I hope you're going to make us some nice wine. So all wines have fruit flavours and what fruit can you smell inside this wine? You can start with the fruit because that's always the easiest thing. And I'll give you a little clue. Every single white wine always has a chemical compound when you break it down called citronelle which is also found inside lemon so our brains sort of match up those two chemical components that are inside those two things and it means that all white wine smells of lemons because all white wine also have citronelle as a chemical compound inside it so we can start with lemon but I went a bit further than lemon because this wine feels aged because it has it's a whole 10 months in barrique as well so it's really concentrating flavor it's less fresh lemons it's more a sort of lemon rind it's more almost almost dried lemons really interesting <laughs> Emily is saying guilty um so oh Louise is on board of the wine tour and I'm on board for you to come Louise because I saw your Instagram and your canapes look fantastic so yes please come and bring snacks uh, Nikki is saying apple Tim is saying, honey, yes. That's going on to our second circle. So um, yeah, apple, lemon, peel, pear, elderflower, peach, yes. So these are all the fruits. And then everyone is now moving into our 
second circle, which is where the flavors start to get more interesting. As you age a wine, it starts to develop some of these second circle flavors. So not all wines have this. It's the wines that have real interest behind them. So, <laughs> Anna has said not to insult Peter, but this reminds me of an excellent dry West Country cider. I kind of see it, that really concentrated apple. Yes, I'm on board with that. And then honey, vanilla, oak, almond, yeah, more honey. Exactly that. This wine has so much going on inside it. Plus cider. <laughs> I've also put caramel and butter inside here as well, and a few like white flowers as well. You're having these sort of really heavy aged notes, but you're having some balance with it as well by having that sort of light floral, citrus, pear, apricot going on at the same time. You want balance between those two circles. You can just have the sort of fruit circle without anything else. But if you are gonna go into the second circle, you need to balance it really well with the fruits of the first circle. Um, everyone's agreeing about the cider, yes. <laughs> Wonderful concentrated apples. So the reason why I said butter in this wine is it has more of a buttery texture, it's less on the nose, but it's when you taste it, there's an almost slight creamy butteriness to it. And when Peter makes this wine, it's aged 10 months in side barrels. And it also has that entire time with lees aging as well. And lees are when your yeast cells, from when you make wine, you have your yeast, it eats up the sugar, creates alcohol. But because yeast is a bacteria, and we all know from living through a pandemic, when you wash something with um, alcohol, it kills off bacteria. So as the yeast is creating alcohol, the alcohol is killing off the bacteria. So our yeast is dying and dead yeast is called lees. And when you age something on lees, Peter described it in this really lovely way. He said that lees are sort of like the mother of the wine. They protect the wine completely. They don't let anything happen to the wine. Um, and they sort of protect it in this almost case and allow it to age and sort of give it nutrients and make it sort of into this creamy, buttery, full rounded wine. So lees are amazing for wine, they're a really, really good thing. And they've been left with this wine for 10 months, which is a really, really long amount of time. So we're getting all the benefits from the lees aging. So what is everyone's verdict on this one? You've already seen my verdict. Um, I won't show you again, I will. Can you see the love hearts? I think they're good. Sorry, Tim. Um, but what is everyone's verdict on this wine? And the reason why we do our verdict is so that you can always come back to your tasting cards and you can see which wines you liked, which wines you didn't like, what you liked inside them. And what's really great is at the moment, we've got a new website. I don't know if everyone's seen our new website, but it means that you can log in onto the website on your account and then you can put everything about your tasting card on there. So you can put your verdict on the website and your favourite wines that you like, we'll send you an email and maybe give you a little discount for them if you want any more of them. But this wine, if you'd like to buy it in the shop, you're very welcome to. We have um, more in surplus store if you would like some. So our surplus store is open. This wine is £18. We have a few different Chardonnays. So those who are saying, I think someone said they weren't a fan of Chardonnay usually. Um, my sister claims she doesn't like Chardonnay, but she is wrong. Um, Chardonnay is one of those grapes where it's really neutral grape variety. It can grow anywhere from Wales to South Africa to New Zealand and it'll taste different wherever you grow it. So you can't really say what a Chardonnay tastes like because it'll absorb its flavours from whoever has made that wine. And it's such a good sort of base wine. I always talk about it like it's a, like it's a blank canvas of a grape variety. And it always attracts winemakers who want to do something, create something with their wine so they can tweak it and change it. Like Peter has with all the sort of barrique aging and the lees aging. You can tweak it to exactly what you want. It's a blank canvas. You can do whatever you like with Chardonnay. So when people say they don't like Chardonnay, it's often a Chardonnay style that they've had. It's the winemaking style that they've not enjoyed. But have I sold Chardonnay to you yet? Maybe, we'll see. But we do have some more Chardonnays in store, so we've got, um, we've got a South African one, 
um, also £18, but it, it feels quite different. They both feel very sort of burgundy style Chardonnay. And what I love is because we're not buying them, because they're not being grown in Burgundy, it means that you're not buying land in Burgundy, which is very expensive. It means you're not having the Burgundy label on top of that and the sort of taxes that you have in Burgundy to even just plant your vine. And then you're having all these costs added on inside a Burgundy wine that, yes, it's a beautiful, amazing wine, but we have an amazing South African one. We have an amazing, uh, not Burgundy, Chardonnay from the Czech Republic. And it means that because they don't have the name Burgundy on their label, it means that people don't immediately go to them straight away because it's all about supply and demand in wine. But I think you're getting incredible, incredible value here. This wine in Burgundy will be sold for so much more. And this is why the Czech Republic is getting so popular because you're getting these amazing wines for this amazing value. And it's only gonna get better and better and better. So I'm so excited, especially for the Marada Vineyard, because I think it's gonna do amazing things and beat Burgundy in sort of, I mean, it should be this year, but in five years time, we'll be better than Burgundy, definitely. This is a wonderful wine. So everyone is loving this wine. Wonderful, I'm so glad you enjoy it. And um, Tim says, will it age well? I think it's drinking really well now because you've got to sort of think about the balance between the body and the acidity you have. Because we have quite a bit of acidity still, you can age it a little bit longer because the acidity will sort of, you'll get less acidity as you go on. But I think it's drinking really well now so you've got a really nice amount of acidity now. Maybe age it for another year, maybe two years, but I wouldn't go too far with this because you don't want to lose any of that lovely balance. Denise loved it, wonderful. George says, Chardonnay really shows off the terroir. Wonderful use of French, George, beautiful. Um, everyone really enjoyed it, wonderful, I'm so pleased. I'm obsessed with this wine. I could talk about it for another hour if you want to, but we will have to move on to the next wine. Um, but thank you so much, Peter, and to your wife, Vera, as well, for joining us in the comments. Um, as you can see, we loved your wine so much, and we can't wait to see what you do next year as well. It's very exciting. But thank you, Peter. Thank you, Vera. Cheers. Oh, wonderful. So the next wine that we have, we have gone polar opposite with our wines this month. And I think it's really exciting because the first wine that we had, the white wine, has been incredibly aged. It's incredibly concentrated. It's got four years. It's got all the bells and whistles on it. It's an incredibly complex wine. Very traditional too. But <laughs> the next one that we have is completely, completely different. So this one is Duzat. And this one is from Paderi Solario. So this is made by Fausto. And Fausto is, um, he's just the coolest person you've ever met really. Um, he's cooler than me. If you think you're cooler than him, you probably aren't, I'm not gonna lie. Fight me in the comments if you want to, but Fausto is a very cool man. He lives in the Langer region in Northern Italy and where he is, it's on very, very steep slopes. It's quite, it's quite far up in the hills, so it's cooler climate. Lots of sort of wind, lots of cooling influences from being so high up. And it's very, very close to the ocean as well. So what Fausto likes to do is in summer, he goes surfing and in winter, he goes snowboarding. He takes all of his sons with him. And, oh, his one son who doesn't um, snowboard, he skis and surf, takes the mick out of him because it's not as cool to ski apparently. <laughs> so Fausto's vineyard is a family owned. It's been in the family for generations because he also, like Peter, comes from a family of farmers. Um, like me as well, I come from a family of farmers and I think it's less so in England but definitely in Europe. People's families have a farm and you sort of have lots of different things going on inside the farm. You pass it through the generations. So for instance, Peter's family weren't just focused on winemaking when it was his grandfather. He had plum trees, he had horses, he had sheep, he had cattle. And it's the same with Fausto as well. They were sort of doing lots of different things that were going on. So when it came to Fausto's turn to take over the vineyard, he decided that he actually wanted to um, go to art school and become an artist. 
And that was his passion. It was all about art. But his father said no. And he told him that he had to take over the family farm and the family vineyard. So Fausto started training up. He went to Bordeaux and he went to Pomerol and he worked in a chateau in Pomerol. Pomerol is amazing, very expensive Bordeaux wine. And Fausto picked up a lot of really interesting techniques from there. So you can see he's saying, hi, is that Andrea Solario? Is that Fausto? I think so. Um, Denise says Piedmont is my region. Nice. I like that, Denise. Um, so Fausto learned lots of techniques in Bordeaux and his favourite technique that he learned was about aging wine inside concrete. So Fausto still uses some oak aging, mainly in different wines though. This one he ages in concrete and he likes using concrete because he learned that in Pomerol and it means that you can really sort of keep an eye on the wines but with very very little oxygen. So Shall we start drinking? We'll break. There's a lot to say about this wine, like, like the last one. I've got a lot to say about everything though. Um, but we'll start drinking it and breaking it down because Tim's probably already started. So cheers everyone. Cheers to Fausto and to his wife Cinzia as well. Cheers. Ooh, wonderful. So we're gonna look at the color again and we'll hold it over our tasting card, look over the top and compare the colour to pure white on our tasting card. So we want to look, when we're looking with a red wine, how clear, how see-through is that wine? Can you see through it? You can even do it with your hand to be honest. You can see, if you can see your hand on the other side, I can kind of see my hand, which means it's not super intense in colour, it's definitely sort of on the lighter side. And what's really, what's really interesting with this one is can you see it's sort of got this wonderful purplish hint to it? Um, Natasha and Joshua just asked a question about he's going for biodynamic. Um, so Fausto is, well Fausto's wife Chinzia, she is allergic to sulfites. So it's a very small amount of the population who are allergic to sulfites, but it's, sulfites are a preservative and they are found in not just wine, but also fruit juices and dried fruit, dried apricots, and lots of fresh things that you find inside the supermarket. They put sulfites to preserve it so that when you open that, it's still going to be just as fresh as the day that they sealed it up. So Fausto's whole philosophy about wine is he wants to create low sulfite wine so that his wife can enjoy it, which is such a wonderful thing. Um, he did say that she enjoys it a lot and drinks more than him, but I'm not sure, we'll see. Um, <laughs> so this is low sulfite wine, but as well as that, his whole philosophy is low intervention. He doesn't want to, he wants to let the wine be what it wants to be. He, the whole biodynamic part is because he doesn't want to use any chemicals inside the vineyard. So when you are, there's different levels. When you are organic, it means that you don't use any pesticides, you don't use any chemicals, and it's basically the same being organic in wine as being organic when you buy sort of organic eggs or organic bread or organic Weetabix. Um, so that's organic, but when you're biodynamic, Frausto is mostly organic, tries to not use any pesticides. Um, when you are biodynamic, that means you do a few, you are organic, but you have some extra things too. So biodynamic is based on the astrological calendar. So you basically follow a moon calendar for when you plant your grapes, for when you harvest, for when you prune. And this is based on Rudolf Steiner's teachings of the 1920s when he saw that people were really sort of factory farming and factory farming was really intense on the fields. And it saw, it lacked some biodiversity and some vineyards were really starting to deteriorate because of it. So he came up with a whole theory of how to farm in a more sustainable way. Um, but sustainable, but he's, it's further than just sustainable because it's sort of astrological as well. So Fausto bought a few vineyards, a few hectares of land off um, one of his neighbors who's this big sort of loves biodynamic wines, loves biodynamic farming and he knows all about it. So he was selling off some of his biodynamic vineyards. So Fausto bought some of these and is trying to move into it himself. 
he's organic now it takes years to become biodynamic because you need to sort of have this whole cycle in place and it takes a whole year to have a whole cycle of a grapevine so this is um this is organic it's not quite biodynamic but i love winemakers who are moving into it it means that when you look at a winemaker's bottle they can't always put exactly what they're doing on the bottle but it's great to see that people are sort of tra changing trying new things it's really interesting but what he does put on his bottle um <laughs> is he paints his labels i love these so you can see on this he has painted so i asked him why he painted this and it's basically this is signifying the really steep hills the steep mountains that they're based on and that's where their vineyard is but it's also showing the proximity to the sea down here so you're getting the sort of the cooling influence from the mountains and the sea so it's an extra extra cool vineyard um well done emily for remembering the cow manure buried in a horn yeah that's one of the biodynamic biodynamic things um so our color with this wine pretty definitely not intense not light sort of medium and a bit less on this one it's got some nice clarity to it we'll measure the tannins and acidity on this wine um and then we'll talk about it so tannin on wine is coming from the grape skin so when you measure tannin if you take a sip how much is your mouth drying out so if it is sort of really really drying out feels like the sahara desert that is when you have really high tannin but if it feels very silky and just slips down it means it's quite low tannin whereabouts do you think this one sits and as you're thinking about that as well try and make a distinction between the tannin and the acidity so as we know tannin is drying our mouth out but acidity is making our mouth water so where does one stop and the other one start you can do the dribble test at the same time and i will do it with you now so we're going to see how much we're going to dribble and luckily i'm not wearing white i nearly did um this wine does come out i got it on my shirt last week i got it out don't worry so we'll take a sip swallow it and we'll open our mouth and tilt our head forward and count how many seconds it takes us before we want to dribble on ourselves so chin chin <laughs> that's quite high acidity is everyone else's mouth watering yeah my mouth is watering quite a bit um but where's the tannin have you got tannin inside there is your mouth watering while you think about this what i'm going to do is i'm going to show you a map well i'll show you fausto first this is fausto i found this picture of you <laughs> i hope that's okay this is fausto and this is wife chinzia and um, that's them with their enormous enormous barrels and this is where they are in italy so they're right up there in langer just near the sea with the mountains you can sort of it's on the very top left of italy that's where you have all the alp all the alps it's very alpine up there so it's sort of becoming less alpine and rolling into much lower hills down here so what is everyone saying with uh, tannin and acidity? Tim is saying three to four seconds before he dribbled on himself. Oh, Emily is saying super earthy, woody, gorgeous. I love this wine so much. So opposite to the last one, but I love them completely equally. They're just, they're two wines made for completely different things. Oh God, I love them. Um, so fairly high tannin, fairly high acidity. I was fairly high acidity with this one. I was pretty high acidity. I was only sort of two, three seconds before I wanted to dribble on myself, basically. I think this wine has some great acidity behind it. And the tannin is sort of medium, less a bit. I think it's below medium on tannin with this one. The tannin is definitely there. But interestingly, the way Faust had made this wine is, you can see it, there's a little hashtag on this. You can use the hashtag if you want. Um, but do send us lots of pictures because I love seeing your Instagrams. But you put hashtag uva in terra, and uva means grape, and it means an intact grape. So this is harking back to sort of the old method, and it is 
it's talking about keeping the grapes intact because what happens is they are put in a vat and they don't have any oxygen inside there. There's a lot of carbon dioxide and the grapes are sort of intact and they start fermenting inside here, but while still intact, so the juice is fermenting inside itself. And it means that um, it's, it's almost like semi-carbonic maceration, but not quite. So it's fermenting inside there and it means that you have really sort of soft, juicy, low tannin wine which is like in Beaujolais. So when we talk about semi-carbonic maceration, that's just the lengthy way of saying what's happening in that process. And that is what we do in Beaujolais in France. And that means they make really super juicy young wine, really low tannin, really, really easy drinking. And that's what they're doing here. But um, what's interesting is in Beaujolais, they start off with quite a low tannin, juicy wine in the first place. But here in Lange, they're starting with Dolcetto. So when you look at the name of this wine, it's Duzat. And Duzat is the Piemontese word, which is a French Italian dialect, Piemontese. It's what Faust and all of his family speak. He said it's what the farmers speak, but it's what everyone speaks in that region. And Duzat is the Piemontese word for Dolcetto, the grape variety. So Dolcetto is a quite a big grape. It means little sweet one, but I don't think it's ever little or sweet. It has quite a lot of tannin behind it. It's got a lot of color behind it as well. So it's quite an intense grape. But by using this method, this semi-carbonic maceration kind of method, uva in terra, it means that they're really sort of creating a soft, juicy, easy drinking wine. And this is Fausto's philosophy, easy drinking wine, such easy drinking wine that um, when we were on our Zoom call, I think it was on a Thursday afternoon, and Fausto was like, this is how easy drinking this wine is. And he opened uh, one of his wines, I had a big sip of it straight away, and he was like, that's how easy drinking it is. I think he finished the whole glass off in one. <laughs> and I was like, oh, definitely easy drinking. And you know what? I've now tried all of his wines, and I agree, they are very easy drinking. We, um, we love Fausto's wines so much that we've imported three of them. We couldn't hold back, they were all so good. So we have this Duzat. Um, if you want more of this in the store, it's 15 pounds. We also have another red wine, it's called A Rosso, and it's in a litre size bottle. And this is again, going back to Fausto on the vineyard, he wanted to show wine that was made in the same way that his grandfathers did it. And it's in a litre bottle because Back in those days, his grandfather would sort of have a litre bottle of water in one of those old fashioned glass bottles, finish that and fill it back up with wine and put a sort of beer cap top on it. And that's exactly why um, he's made it inside that litre bottle again. It's going back to that. He wants easy drinking wine, a wine that you can just open up on an afternoon, enjoy it. He doesn't want the pretense or the fuss. I think what I really loved is he said he's not making wine that's sort of being marked by Robert Parker for 90 points out of 100. He's making wine that you want to open. You want to crack open that bottle, drink it on an afternoon, and my goodness I have, and it was the easiest drinking wine I have ever, ever had. So shall we talk about our well, tannin, a bit less than medium, acidity, quite high quite a juicy, easy drinking one. Um, but that's why, that's our tannin. That's where we're getting that lovely balance from. If you just made a red wine from Dolcetta, it'd be really high tannin, but we're saving it, swooping in. Where is our sweetness on this wine? Do you think it's dry or do you think it's sweet? Again, it's going back to how much sugar is actually inside your wine. And um, Sam and Charlotte are talking about what food they're having with it. Oh, wonderful. When I asked Fausto about what food should go with this wine, he said, whatever you want. We make wine for just easy drinking. You can have anything with it. It's not gonna clash with anything. It's not gonna be in the way of anything. It's just gonna go down really nicely and it's gonna go really well with Italian food. Um, Sam and Charlotte are having it with fennel tarali. Oh, I don't even know what that is, but that sounds fantastic. It sounds really good. I think on the back, I recommended um, a rocket salad. And the reason is this wine's so juicy. I think when you're having the fennel, it's a bit like rocket. It's got that really sort of powerful flavor. This is 
easy, juicy wine. So it's going to match that and balance out really, really well. Um, I know we've already planned a holiday to the Czech Republic, but shall we all go surfing with Fausto as well? I think Tim's up for it. Um, <laughs> Emily's up for it. Okay, perfect. Italian holiday. <laughs> so what is the body like on this wine? You can think about glasses of milk again. Is it light in body? Does it feel like water? Does it sit very clean? Or is it really rich and round and heavy? Is it full on the palate? Um, <laughs> I'm really jealous because I've always wanted to learn to surf because it sounds wonderful. I'm just not cool enough to surf. I'll try it one day maybe. I just feel like I'll just be drinking wine on the beach, it's fine. Um, so Tim has had exactly what we said on the tasting card, which is rocket salad with balsamic vinegar. Yes, very nice. I'm so glad you're going with that, Tim. I love it when we do um, wine and food pairings because there's so many times where you have sort of a glass of wine with dinner and you just clashes so much, but when you find the perfect pairing, they can make each other better. It's really good. So Denise is saying yes in capital letters. But in terms of body, I think this is medium minus. So it's sort of, it's not the lightest. It's definitely got some really nice body there, but it's not super full bodied. It's easy drinking again, super lovely style. Um, and the way, interestingly, so when Peter was balancing his wine, they were all matched very sort of neatly lined up and it was creating real interest and real impact, but real elegance. But this one, I love how he's balanced all the characteristics because the way he's balanced it, tannins here, acidity here, and body here as well, easy drinking, that's how you balance the wine to make it really refreshing and what I like to call a park wine when you just wanna take it to the garden and drink it all afternoon, which is what I'm all about. Um, and what is the finish like with this wine? So have a sip, swallow it, taste it, count how many seconds you can really taste that flavor for on your palate are we on two seconds actually has anyone been to the pub this week and ordered a two second wine they're not as fun are they um i'm sort of hoping that all the pubs will start to do bottle uh, corkage because i just want to take all my wines with me um, and enjoy them in their beer garden which would be ideal really but what's everyone's finish like on this I think this is, it's still got a nice long finish to it. Definitely not the same as the last one though. It's got a shorter finish, but it's definitely sort of five, six seconds. It's shorter, but it's a much younger wine. This is only a 2020 wine. It's young, it's fresh, it's park wine. So it is just a little bit fresh air shorter finish and I'm completely happy with that still it's a completely opposite wine but it's been completely true to itself it's wonderful <laughs> oh everyone in the comments is very fun so we have our finish and now we're going to talk about our flavors so what flavors is everyone getting inside this wine I think we had a few people say their flavors already and I think everyone was talking about a real juiciness behind it that was it earthy woody what else is everyone getting i'm getting i think i'm mainly concentrating on the first circle with this one i'm getting a lot of fruit straight away when you smell it wonderful wonderful concentrated berries lots of fruit cherries, strawberries, plum. And what's, um, <laughs> what's interesting is I get a slight creaminess on this as well. There's a really sort of wonderful second level to it. Um, John has said he can't wait for hullabaloo in the park. <laughs> hullabaloo, by the way, isn't a party. Um, it's on it's on our website it's one of our other wines that we're having at the moment and we just have it in for a short amount of time but it's a proper park wine it's definitely one to drink on the same day as this you sort of go in start with hullabaloo which tastes like cherry cola but wine wonderful and then i feel like you'd move on to this oh, that'll be a perfect afternoon in the park and um, emily is saying blackberries george is saying strawberry and red cherry yes i agree Hannah is saying plum, blackcurrant, red cherry, 
maybe a bit of licorice. Ooh. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Take a bit of licorice, yeah. Sort of like a sweetness with a hint of spice behind it as well. Cherry Bakewell. Yes, Diane, definitely. Um, Tim's saying not strong on the nose. I think it's got quite a good intensity to it. The last wine had a real intensity on the nose. And intensity on the nose is something you talk about when it's um, how far away you can be from your glass where you can still smell your wine. So the last wine that we had, that Chardonnay, I opened it across the room and I could smell it that it had been opened. This one, you have to be just in front of your glass and then smell it. But I think it's still got a really good intensity on nose as well. Um, John said he, don't, he doesn't know how to pronounce hullabaloo. Uh, it took me 10 attempts in the office the other day. Um, hullabaloo, that's what we're going to go with. That's the official wine list stance and how to pronounce it. <laughs> so George is saying rose and chocolate. I get what you mean with the sort of sweetness from chocolate. I agree with rose. I put more violet, very similar. But um, when you have that sort of chocolate flavor coming from wine, that's more when you have an aged wine, usually when you age it inside a barrel. Like our last one had that real sort of caramel, almost vanilla from the pure barrel aging and age. This one is really young, really fresh, made inside concrete. So it doesn't quite have that chocolate, but I think when, um, who was it who said, Hannah said the licorice earlier. It's that sort of sweet spice that you're talking about. So it's definitely that sort of same, yeah. Oh, wonderful. Um, if you like this wine, definitely buy the Aroso, his litre bottle version. It is absolutely wonderful. I had it with a friend and it was very easy to drink a whole litre of wine. And it's the perfect amount for two people because one bottle is never really enough, two bottles is too much. One litre, perfect. All wine should be in one litre bottles. And we also, the third one that we bought is a sparkling, it's a pet nat, but a rosé pet nat. And that is aged inside oak. So that one is 2019, so it's two years old. And it's got some funky, wonderful flavours going on inside it. Lovely amount of fizz to it. Um, I love Pet Nat, it's wonderful. Um, we've, I think we're all we're already low on stocks of it. So it's going down a real, real treat. And it's very, very good. Um, what does everyone think about this wine? What's everyone's verdict on it? I am going to draw a huge smiley face on mine. Don't have a pen though. But this is going to be a massive smiley face. I think it's just the cheeks are going to go up to on top of the page. Um, my mum, this is her new favourite red wine. She absolutely loves it. Um, and she claimed that she didn't have a headache the next day because of sulphites, but she's not allergic to sulphites, so I don't know how that happened. I think she just had a glass of water, so she's fine. <laughs> but this is such an easy drinking wine. I really, really enjoyed it. So opposite to the first one. The first one is one of those wines where you want it sort of, not even with food, it'd be amazing with food when you have something really full like roast chicken, roasted vegetables, because it's so full bodied and has so much full flavour, it means that it can take a lot of flavour inside food. It can take a whole meal, like a roast dinner basically. Actually, yeah, very good one for a roast dinner if you don't want a red wine, yeah. This one, completely opposite. It's one of those wines that you just want to open and drink and enjoy and sort of not even have time to put the glass down because you just want to constantly take sips from it. Sam and Charlotte also love it. Um, Tim normally needs to drink red with food, but this he can have on its own. That's exactly what I thought as well. And I think what's really interesting is this one is super super drinkable you don't need food but when you sort of move to the a rosso the big liter one that's even more so you don't even need to think about food not even a crisp not even a packet of crisps you can just sit and sip it all afternoon it's a really really good wine especially for the summer i am going to buy an entire case um hannah really lovely emily delicious oh we've got some love heart eyes Wonderful. Emma says lovely as well. Amazing. Fausto, everyone loves your wine so much. They are wonderful. Um, I love the wine and I also love the labels. So I hope that you can paint us a picture and send it over to us. <laughs> but thank you ever so much to everyone. Um, thank you, Fausto, for coming to join us. Um, thank you to your wife, Chinzia, as well, for coming to join us too. 
but I hope everyone enjoyed both of the wines this evening. I very much did. Um, I can't even decide which one's my favourite, that's why I'm not asking you. Completely opposite wines, we can't even decide my favourite this week. Um, but really great wines. But thank you to everyone. Um, we will be back next month with the same tasting. But in the meantime, we have some tastings which you can either do with me on Zoom or you can do it on demand. So we have a Sauvignon Blanc tasting and we have a Napa Valley tasting. So it's tastings by the glass where we sort of find some really, really fun and unusual and sometimes very old wines. And it's a tasting where you can taste all the way through all the different Sauvignons or look at all the different grapes that you can get inside Napa Valley in America. So definitely buy tickets for that. If you can't make it to the actual date on the event, drop us an email, let us know. And then if you want to attend the on-demand one, that is no problem. We will send you the link for it. Um, but thank you so much, everyone. Do update your account on the website so you can sort of put which wines are your favourite? I can't choose between these two. I just want both of them. I'm going to mark them very equally. Um, but update it. Let us know. I want to hear everything about your wines. And also send us all the pictures and put it on your Instagram and tag us at the wine list. Because I'm really nosy and I just really want to see what you're doing and sort of what canapes you're having. But thank you so much, everyone. It was lovely to have you all again. Thank you to Fausto and Peter for joining us. And enjoy the rest of your wines. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Goodbye, everyone.